You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello and welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. This week I have somebody joining us who is a military veteran and he's going to be telling his stories from the front line, how that affected him and how he subsequently went back um, and now how he's making some change in the mental health space and uh, making a big impression. So we will get onto that in just a second. Before we do, if you haven't yet had a chance to head over and check out anxietypodcast.com, you can do that. I've been updating the free resources so you can click on the free tab and find out um, what's available for you there. The End Anxiety Toolkit, um, which includes some audio, a video, an ebook, everything to delight all of your senses is involved. So have a look at that. Um, also, if you want to follow me on social media, you can. I post fairly regularly. You can see all sorts of the different stuff I get up to. Um, Facebook, you can follow me. My personal account is Tim JP Collins. So you can add me as a friend if you want to be friends, or you can just search the anxiety podcast. And actually, while you're on our website, um, if you look on the front page, there is a, a button to join the Less Anxiety, More Life community, and you can join the Facebook group and post in there um, and see what we're all up to. Uh, I'm also Tim J.P. Collins on Twitter and on Instagram. I am Anxiety Coach. So have a look at that and uh, yeah, get in touch. I love hearing what people are up to and seeing how I can help you out in your journey to recovery. Okay, so this week's guest Stéphane Grenier is a veteran of the Canadian military um, who retired as a a lieutenant colonel in England. They say lieutenant, but I'll I'll go with the North American vernacular. Lieutenant colonel following 29 years of service and numerous overseas missions in such places as Cambodia, Haiti, Lebanon, Kuwait, and most notably, he spent 10 months in Rwanda in 94-95 um, when, uh, you know, times were very tough in that region, and he'll tell us a bit more about that. Um, upon coming back from Rwanda, Stefan had some, had some challenges with PTSD, and kind of being in the military provided its own unique circumstances around that, but I will let him go into more detail and kind of explain to you what happened. He's now um, working on mental health um innovation, I was going to say, in terms of changing the narrative, as he says, around uh, moving from, you know, just talking about mental health to actually doing something about it. And he articulates this beautifully, so I won't steal his thunder and kind of give that away. But um, he has made a number of changes and impressions in in the kind of mental health space over the years. And uh, I think he's still got a few more under his belt. Um, so he'll, he'll go into those in a bit more detail. So without further ado, let's chat to Stefan. Okay. So Stefan Grenier, welcome to the anxiety podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Um, so as we were just talking last time, I tried to, uh, interview, interview you, you were sunning yourself in Costa Rica. Um, but you're back in Canada now. Absolutely. I'm back in Canada. And um, actually, it's um, it's funny that we talk now because next week, uh, my charity is hosting a national conference on peer support. So these are exciting times for us. So uh, glad to be back at home. Yeah, great. So before we get into the charity and into the, the work you're doing today, um, would love to, to share some of your story with the listeners and, and kind of allow people to get to know you and your background a bit more if you would be so kind. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, um, you know, I, uh, I joined the military at a, a, at a young age, um, straight out of high school, uh, and spent, um, the better part of three decades in the military. And my career was divided in, I would say three different sort of experiences. My first experience, my first 10 years was with, uh, an armored regiment and in, in the combat arms, um, uh, for, for 10 years and, and was a leadership instructor in, in British Columbia, actually, in, in Chilliwack, British Columbia. The second part of my career was um, spent in uh, communications and uh, 
media relations with the military. And that second part of my career is, is really where I, I experienced a lot of um, different deployments overseas, uh, including, you know, the the big one for me was Rwanda for over 10 months, which really changed sort of my my life and my perspective on things and realized that, you know, the brain is no more immune to illness and injury than the rest of the human anatomy is. And the third part of my career in the military was all about developing what I call non-clinical mental health programs to help people uh, cope and recover from these conditions. And that then, uh, you know, at the, at the tail end of my career, the last two years, uh, I was seconded to the Mental Health Commission of Canada, uh, working on a project, a national project around peer support. Then I left the military, started a charity um, started a, my own social enterprise where we help organizations move forward and, and really we, we really help organizations walk the talk. You know, we, we hear a lot about, you know, talking about mental health and the Bell Let's Talk campaign. And I think we're done talking. We, just, we need to start walking the talk. So my company really helps organizations move forward in a tangible way. And uh, that's where we're at. So that's sort of a very quick synopsis. Mm-hmm. So, on with regards to your kind of uh, active service, I don't know if that's the right vernacular for it, but um, what what happened uh, as a result of the Rwanda experience for you? Yeah, so um, we got to go back to the nineteen. The Cold War basically ends, you know, at the in the very early nineties, and the Canadian military has been, you know, literally doing training. Uh, so my first part of my career was all about, you know defending Europe and, and the North American continent uh, against the Russian invasion, you know, mm-hmm. the USSR. And so as the, as the 1990s approached, uh, the military really rapidly had to change modes here. So we went from the Cold War to being sent all over the, the world uh, doing, you know, trying to do traditional peacekeeping operations, but in a very, very chaotic world. So there were no ceasefires in a lot of places where we served, but we had, you know, chapter six, you know, uh, UN regulation and, and rules of engagements to follow, which, which are not conducive when bullets are flying. So essentially when, when I found myself in Rwanda, the war uh, had started already. Uh, this was that, that, that chapter six that you mentioned, is that essentially saying that you can't shoot back if people shoot at you? Yes, absolutely. Right. That's the traditional. So there's a ceasefire, the belligerents on either side of a demilitarized zone and peacekeepers are there maintaining the peace. But of course, that sort of approach uh, is fine when there's peace to be maintained. But there's a, when there's a war raging, you and peacekeepers find themselves in a very, very morally conflicting position. Right. Yeah. Um, and so um, when I arrived in Rwanda in very early May, uh, the atrocities had already been going on for about three weeks. Uh, the war were, was raging. In fact, the uh, uh, the Rwandan Patriotic Army, w- which was sort of attacking the government forces who were prosecuting uh, this genocide, were actually battling for Kigali, the capital. Uh, and uh, I landed, got off a plane, and uh, my my sort of experience in Rwanda started on on a very very rainy day. The tarmac was, you know, the the Hercules aircraft landed, never shut off its engines. The cargo was was literally expelled out of the back of the plane. And that actually that day, uh, the, this was one of the last flights for about three, four days or a week because the plane went back home with bullet holes in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were really th- literally almost thrown off the plane um, and and in about six inches of water and um uh, and my, my tour started. Right. Uh, and, uh, and, and then of course, 10 and a half months later, I returned home a very, very different person. Mm. And, and you, uh, somewhere, I, something you wrote, I read, which said you, you're kind of, uh, you were faced with your own undiagnosed PTSD. So did you, were you aware of what PTSD was at this point when you were experiencing all this stuff? Or do you just think it was part of the job? Oh, absolutely not. I think that uh, going back to what I said earlier regarding, you know, the the Cold War era, I mean, we I was completely and my colleagues were completely oblivious to the fact that the brain right could could get injured or or become ill. Um, And so 
as I was going through experiences, as my colleagues were going through some pretty bad days, uh, we were sort of just, you know, shuffling along, completely oblivious to this um, to this reality. And it was only years later, you know, when you stitch it back together, figuratively speaking, mm. that you realize. Now, um, you know, I, I will share with you, Tim, that um, I have been debating this whole ordeal. And, and for those listeners who know me, you know that I am not ashamed at all of having developed what I call an operational stress injury, um, what people call a mental illness, you know, PTSD, depression, things of that nature. I'm not ashamed at all. But I am currently writing a book and I'm currently making the point in that book that uh, there is another diagnosis about to be born. And I'm not for the proliferation of multiple diagnoses, but I do believe firmly, firmly, firmly believe that uh, we are misdiagnosing so many people under the auspices of trauma and PTSD, when in fact, what happens to a lot of human beings is a huge, huge amount of moral conflict. Now, moral conflict could be perceived as being traumatic because, you know, it's moral conflict normally happens in very trying times. But I do believe that, you know, and this may sound weird to your audience, but I don't think I have PTSD. You know, I, I have something else, which is a hybrid between PTSD and depression. And some clinicians will probably say, well, of course, Stefan, you have comorbid depression along with your PTSD. So don't don't question things. But as as I read into all of this and as I look back at my own experiences, there's something else happening, uh, which clinicians and the American Canadian Psychiatric Association has yet to grasp. And hopefully my book is going to be a catalyst to get that conversation going. And is what is the phenomenon you're describing or the condition you're describing? Do you think uh, specific to conflict being in conflict? Uh, not necessarily. I think that um, I think that conflict will pit the human being uh, in the face of adversity and what I refer as moral conflict, which is, you know, a decision to be made. Do I turn left? Do I turn right? Should I have done this? Should I have done that? Did I do enough? Oh, my God. What if I had done this? A constant questioning of your actions when you're put into extreme situations. But I have to say in my work now with civilian organizations, corporations, uh, government organizations, private enterprises, I see people who are morally conflicted every single day, Tim. And, and, and of course, the moral conflict there may not be as obvious. It may not be as intense, but it is as devastating, I think, over time. And I have so many examples of human beings who are working day in, day out, and at one point really start to suffer from the accumulation of day in, day out, a little bit of moral conflict here, a little bit more here, and, and, and it's, it's, it's a trying situation. Now, of course, you know, I'm not trying to, 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 to get the credit for a new diagnosis to be born, not at all, but I'm trying to really focus our, our clinical and, and, and our workplaces on the notion that it's not always trauma. Uh, and, and biological factors that, that affect people. There are other conditions that are, are more pervasive or more hypocritical in a sense that we really, really need to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. What, what happened on your return from Rwanda in terms of both your role and your mental state? So, um, it, it's funny because as I write this book, you know, I look back and I'm thinking, oh, my God, it, it, it should have been so obvious to me, knowing what I know now, that when this particular incident happened in Rwanda, that this was the beginning of a long domino, a series of dominoes falling that would lead to me, you know, snapping back home, um, becoming mildly suicidal, becoming very actively suicidal and and having all sorts of behaviors at work, which was completely, completely and utterly unacceptable for a military person, right? Uh, where I would, uh, I would snap at superiors. I would, I would be rude to people. Now, I've always been a, a pretty self-confident individual, Tim. I don't think I was ever a cocky individual, but I was certainly self-confident. When, when self-confidence metamorphosizes itself in, into something that would be perceived as arrogance, I remember the, the day I... Uh, 
I showed up at uh, the military hospital because the evening before I had come pretty close to taking my own life. And I remember sitting in the parking lot thinking, when I go in the hospital, I'm going to have to write down on a piece of paper, you know, my serial number, my name, my rank, the time I come in and what's wrong with me. And normally Mm -hmm. when a military person goes to the hospital, he writes, I twisted my ankle. I have a sore throat. I have a headache that won't go. I have a cold. I need antibiotics. And it's just part of the normal triage process. But I remember sitting in my car for 10, 15, 20 minutes, maybe thinking, what do I put on the sheet of paper? I can't put down that I was suicidal. A subordinate, a corporal is going to read that and go, oh, my God, this guy's crazy. Yeah. And so yeah. I ended up going into the hospital and um, and uh, filled out the piece of paper without putting what they call a diagnosis on there. And I went to sit down to wait my turn. And the corporal called me back and he said, I'm sorry, sir, you have to put down what's wrong with you. And I said, no, no, I just want to see a doctor. And, of course, he was just doing his job, the poor guy. Uh, but at the same time, I'm very uncomfortable. And he's doing his job. He said, well, I'm sorry, so you're going to have to write something down. And I snapped. I, I literally said, and I swore, and I said, if you don't let me see a doctor without me putting something on there, I'm going to leave, and you're going to see me back here in a body bag. And, you know, that is not me. I don't I, 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 I don't think I was ever rude to people who are subordinate to me. I, I think I was a pretty nice leader. You know, I never th- thought. And as that was happening, I was thinking, what's wrong with me? But of course, now I look back and of course, I was so confused and I didn't I was embarrassed at the time. And um, and so that that was my first experience with the medical system to some degree. And when you spoke to the doctor, what was the response? Was it medication or psychotherapy? Like what was your initial interface with a, with a solution to the problem? Well, I got to say my first encounter with the first general practitioner was absolutely textbook perfect. I went in there. I saw uh, she was a female doctor, a major uh, general practitioner. She was very kind. We had maybe a 20 minute sort of session, you know, not a session, but a, you know, a 20 minute uh, encounter. Um, she asked, I felt all the right questions. She said, why are you here? She was very nice. She was very professional. Um, and uh, she, she, I wasn't sleeping, of course. So she did prescribe sleeping pills because I, I was a mess. This was about eight, nine months after I returned to Canada and I had come undone quite a bit. Um, and uh, she did refer me to psychiatric services. And at the time, you know, this was 1995 now, the fall of 1995, the system wasn't as robust as it is now. Uh, and I remember that encounter as being so perfect. And I thought, well, this is OK. Um, a week later, I got a call uh, for a, a week later, an appointment. So two weeks after that first appointment, I went for my first appointment with a psychiatrist. And that's when it started to become undone. I mean, uh you know, the psychiatrist was completely inept at creating any kind of a therapeutic alliance or a relationship. There were power differentials. He was wearing his uniform. I felt embarrassed, you know, of talking about such personal things. Um, and without getting into too many details, because that's all in the book, it's uh, it, it was just a terrible experience. I had gone from a great experience of thinking, oh, my God, the system can probably help me here to going back home taking the new pills he had prescribed and flushing them down the toilet and literally after two more appointments, completely abandoning uh, that, uh, that, um, that, that stream of healthcare and, and trying to cope on my own. So did that then put you in a place where you, were, where you sort of decided you would try and work through it and self-heal? Yeah, to some degree. And I think self-healing for a soldier is to literally ignore it, suck it up and trying to move on. And, you know, um, and then I got into a phase of my career, Tim, where I was uh, I became sort of uh, an adrenaline junkie. Any time I was able to be shipped off overseas to I, for much shorter periods of time, mind you. So these weren't full deployments, but I would raise my hand to go to Haiti for a few weeks, Cambodia for a few weeks, uh, Lebanon, the Persian Gulf. I went a couple of times. Uh, anyways, I was I was more comfortable overseas in, uh, you know, with 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 Cambodian deminers crawling on their stomach to try to demine their own country. And, and th- then I was back home trying to fit back in the system Um and and so, um, yeah, I became an adrenaline junkie. And of course, you know, serendipitously or ironically, all of these these 
things I did overseas was, was, it wasn't great, great pieces of work, but I mean, it helped me to get promoted and I got promoted, uh, despite me not being well at all. Um, and I, w- I moved to Toronto in a very boring job. Now, um, and while I was in Toronto, I, I bumped into this, this just great chief of staff, uh, my boss, who, who I always say this, who I did not need institutional permission to heal or recover. But he was so supportive, understanding and caring as a superior that I tasted how important it is for a human being to get that non-clinical support. So he did not pity me. He did not baby me. He, he held me accountable for my work, um, but he allowed me the space and gave me what I call institutional permission to recover. Mm. And that was such a beautiful experience that it allowed me to understand that without that support, very, very difficult to recover. And that was one of many catalysts which allowed me to carve out, I think, the body of work that I've carved out over the last 16 years now. Yeah. It seems that in both in, I mean, it's not obviously uh, specific to Canada that certainly the same stuff would, would happen in uh, with lots of um, different militaries around the world. I know the U S one for sure, because it's, it's often talked about. Um, What do you think's changed since you going through your struggles and today have things got better or things is there still a lot of holes in the system? There's still a lot of people struggling. I don't think there's any less people struggling, but I do know for a fact that people struggle uh, for shorter periods of time before they seek clinical care. So that's a good thing. Uh, we also know that, and, and, you know, I'm, when I started down this, this piece of work, uh, Tim, um, you know, one of the first things I did when I was given the mandate by uh, Lieutenant General Christian Couture to actually develop what I now refer to back as, as non-clinical sort of programs and interventions and, and, and systems, um, I remember thinking, what do, we need to rename this PTSD thing. Now, uh, I was not as, as adamant back then of understanding, I don't think I have PTSD, and that's, that's, that's for another sort of podcast, but... At the time, I thought, we got to stop calling this post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, this is such a bad term. And then we wonder why, why, why in, in my case, why, why in our case in the militaries, we feel stigmatized and we, we don't want to be diagnosed with PTSD. Think about it. I always, I always find it ironic that at the end of the Vietnam War, when tens of thousands of soldiers, veterans from the Vietnam War, were exhibiting these signs and symptoms in the early 80s, that in, in the great wisdom of the American Psychiatric Association, they would have decided this to call this a disorder. Think about it. This is a military population. What do military people do? They follow orders. They show up on time. They dress the same. They walk in an orderly fashion. And in their great wisdom, they call this diagnosis a disorder. And, and so, yes, I'm taking them to task because I think that, you know, language, the narrative is so important. Now you're going to tell me, Tim, yeah, but if you would have called it something else, Stefan, you would have found an, an excuse to not, not accept that term. So back in, back in 2000, 2001, when I, I started this body of work, one of the things I, I did, and I'm really proud of that, is I coined a new term, operational stress injury. And now working with civilian companies and private industry, I just talk about stress injury. Mm. And the purpose there was to do two things. One, create a non-clinical narrative so that the lay people in my organization, the men and women in uniform who are not doctors, can have a term that they can wrap their mind around. Number two, the notion of injury, I think, is huge. Because when we tell somebody you have an illness or you have a disorder or we have a mental illness, and I, I, you know, I, I, and, and this is regarding my body of work in the military now, a lot of us lay people will think, well, my God, this is such a complicated thing. There's very little I can do, so we need a good doctor. And by the way, I am for clinical care. I am for psychiatry. I am for psychology. I take my medication. I'm still I'm treatment compliant, and I, 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 I am in touch with a psychiatrist to this date. However, we don't live in our doctor's offices. And it's so important that 
as we build a new social fabric around mental health and mental illness, then we understand that Canadians, everyday citizens, co-workers, families cannot abdicate their responsibility to supporting their friends, colleagues, loved ones to the clinical system alone. The clinical system cannot resolve all this on their own. They need the support of friends, families, work colleagues. Without that support, you have a two-legged stool. You have pharmacology, you have therapy, and you're missing that third leg, which is social support, which is really instrumental in recovery. Yeah, and is that your your term that you had, which you mentioned earlier on, of peer support, is that really where you're going with, with peer support? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and, and uh, you know, peer support, as everybody knows, existed way before I came on the scene. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, so I would never want anybody to think that I'm, I'm taking any credit for, for discovering peer support. But what I am proud of is that I think that organizations like the military uh, who need this non-clinical intervention as a complement to what's there clinically, uh, it's complex to implement a, a peer support program in a complex organization. And I do that now for a living in workplaces. And workplaces are complex systems with policies, change of command, hierarchies, uh, bosses, policies, programs, doctors, employees, labor relations. These are very complex systems. So when you implement a new system and you embed that system in an existing system, that's called change. And people are resistant to change. And we have to hit the sweet spot of accountability. Uh, we have to make sure that these peer supporters are not just the nice people who have recovered from a mental health problem, who have a bit of training, but we have to make these peer supporters accountable because, of course, a company is 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 liable to everything they do. And, um, and so implementing, I think, this peer support uh, and making it happen, making it real in a corporate setting or any complex sort of system – is what 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 I started doing 16 years ago, and now what I do for for Canadian industry and, and private and, and, and public sector, uh, and it's instrumental. And some organizations, Tim, will tell me, well, we already have peer support. And when I look under under the hood of the peer support program, that's not a peer support program. What they have is maybe an EAP referral program or a peer referral system, where you know I'm a clerk, you're a clerk. You're having a rough time. You come and see me, and I refer you to the EAP. That's not peer support in the true sense. As you know, and most of your listeners know, true mental health peer support is being able to leverage the wisdom and what people have learned through their own recovery journey to the benefit of others who are less further ahead in their recovery journey and who who look at the peer supporter not look up to, but look at the peer supporter as a bit of a beacon of hope that if that person can get through this, darn it, I can get through it too. And so peer support anchors itself in the fact that if a company launches a peer support program under my belief system, they will actually go as far as selecting with our methodology people who have been through a mental health struggle in their lives and bring that to the forefront and actually use that as the strategic enabler to change the culture in the organization. I always say, Tim, we've talked enough about mental health in this country, and we, t we talk enough about the people. Everywhere I go in this country, Tim, I always hear at conferences, did you know that one in five Canadians suffers from a mental health problem? Did you know that any given day, 500,000 Canadians are off work for mental health reasons? You know, we always talk about the people who have mental health problems. I want to leverage these people, not abuse them, not take advantage of them. But they are in companies. They're present in these corporate structures. Why not leverage that as a strategic enabler to actually making a difference? And so as we implement these programs, it's working so well. And if you really want to address the stigma in any system, start in involving the people, the one in five. Stop talking about them. 
Use them. Leverage them. That's how you beat stigma. You don't beat stigma by getting a guy like me to fly in with a plane ticket and a briefcase and brief everybody that one in five people suffer from a mental health problem or even tell my story. And people go, you know, they leave the, the lunch and learn and they think, oh, poor Stefan, he really had a hard time after Rwanda. But that's not lifting stigma. That's sort of making people reflect for 15, 20 minutes after the conference is over and they go home and they go right back to their bad habits or they go back to their email. If you really want to lift stigma, engage the one in five in your workplace, engage these people, give them a mandate, give them a role in in tangibly reshaping the culture of the organization. And that's really what I'm proud of. Yeah. And I think, as you said, it's, uh, it's empowering people. I mean, I feel that, If you look back from when you talk about peer support, I think of like, um, it makes me start to think of how um, disconnected we are, not just in business, but as people in communities now, because, you know, I've read stuff on anxiety or mental health related things from tribal times or from communities of old. And those people would be looked after in a small, you know, small supported by family members and friends in a small environment with lots of human contact and would inevitably recover much quicker than people who are isolated watching Netflix and, you know, in, in chat forums on the internet trying to figure it out on their own. Um, so yeah. I feel like peer support it really spreads across lots of different uh, platforms, right? Absolutely. And, you know, um, when I was at the commission, the Mental Health Commission of Canada for two years on on uh, building standards of practice for peer support in Canada, which uh, is, you know, maybe a lot of your listeners don't know that uh, there is now, you know, my, my charity actually uses the standards of practice um, and, and actually provides a credentialing process um, for for peer supporters who who are looking for work in the mental health system and it, and of course the credentialing process tim does not change necessarily the way a peer supporter does his or her peer support job but what it does is it allows the mental health system the government the hospitals the decision makers the clinicians to understand that there's some rigor now and it's you know and and rigor i think does not need to change necessarily the way people do their, their their peer support but peer support you know occurs on a very very wide ranging spectrum you know you have i visited homeless shelters and walk-in centers uh, in in large cities in this country where uh, you know on the one end of the spectrum you have a very important person who's a peer supporter there who opens the door and who helps people in the the shelter or into the community center and and has a coffee with the person who's been out all night and who has a very good conversation that's peer support at one end of the spectrum at the other end of the spectrum you'll have peer supporters who work in 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 forensic psychiatric units and and of course uh for the peer supporter it can be the same individual by the way if he or she has the skills and competencies um, but the credentialing process is is a way to actually tell the clinical system and demonstrate to the clinical system there is rigor. This person is is has been you know provided a credential, and now I'm hoping that in in ten, fifteen, twenty years from now, the mental health system will no longer allow itself to treat people without peer supporters working alongside clinicians. And it's not that. Peer supporters will save the mental health system from itself. Not at all. But there's the, the recovery philosophy and, and the notion of recovery is such a complement to that clinical approach. And I think that our mental health system will be all that much better when we work hand in glove together and we complement each other. That doesn't mean that the clinical system owns peer support. I think peer support needs to develop in its very own stream and that's what we're doing that's what we're we're striving to achieve but at the same time there has to be a collaborative approach i think the days of down with psychiatrists and down with psychologists and the mental health system is bad uh, need to be over there there's nothing to be gained by having this adversarial relationship and while i understand why it occurred i think now in 2016 it's time to turn that page not forget what happened in the institutionalization days and, 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 and the days that were not so bright, 
but we need to move forward. And if we're really going to help our our sons and daughters and our grandchildren, uh, you know, heal and recover faster from mental illness in the future, we have to stop this 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 divide, and we have to work hand in glove. And and I think that the peer supporters who uh, are successful in the clinical system, working alongside, not necessarily for clinicians, but alongside with them, is the way to truly transform the way patients are cared for. And do you see in in examples of where this has been implemented uh, in companies, how does it affect the, the the stigma in terms of you know people obviously coming forward to be in the peer support role of helping people. Um, and I think some something you said which struck me earlier was the beacon of light. I mean, part of my wish or dream for the podcast is for people to know that, you know, they're not alone. Many of these things that we suffer from make us feel very insular, make us very feel like we're the, you know, uh, certainly when I had anxiety and panic attacks, I was like, nobody can feel as bad as this. Like, it's impossible. So... Um, part of it is, I think, through the shared experience of saying, you know, I've suffered and I have experience and can tell you that it doesn't have to be like this forever. Well, absolutely. And, um, you know, I often say uh, for many, many different situations in life and many health conditions, peer support, uh, I mean, cancer clinics around the country, they, they pretty much all have you know, a peer support system of some sort, a peer support group that meet every Wednesday night between seven and nine, or and they serve coffee, and you have cancer patients who have been through, you know, um, the treatment and chemotherapy that that have survived. And what are they? They're beacons of hope. They're people who have been on that journey and who know the way out. And um, why is it so different for mental health? Why is it so different? It doesn't need to, and it should not be different. The problem is, is that of course, when you have, you know, listen, at my sickest, I should not have been a peer support, for sure. I mean, I, I wasn't sleeping. I was angry all the time. I, w- I wasn't, you know, I, sometimes I wasn't coherent for, for, for all I know. Uh, my judgment was impeded at times because I wasn't sleeping. And so, of course, I was not in the greatest mindset to offer hope for somebody else. But if you think about it, our clinicians in the country only see patients at their worst times. Mental health patients don't go back to their doctor to say, I'm cured, I'm good, I'm recovered, I'm working now. You know, So I'm not giving clinicians an out, but you can't really blame them for being so cautious about, oh, this peer support thing, I don't know, which is why the credentialing process is so important to be able to tell clinicians, listen, there's a way now. It's not only about training. There's a way to actually gauge recovery, look at competencies, train people, assess their knowledge, and assess their ability to bring knowledge and skills and competencies together in this perfect equilibrium where you have very empowering conversations. And so if peer support really did not advance as rapidly as in other health condition sort of uh, scenarios, it's I think it's sort of understandable. Uh, because for sure, when I was at my sickest, if you would have asked my doctor, you know, do you think Stefan could be a peer supporter? Not that he has the authority to say that, but he would have said, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. And looking back, I would have agreed. But at the time, I would have probably thought, no, no, I can do this. Well, maybe you can't. Um, so this credentialing process, I think, is instrumental. And I'm hoping that as we go down the pipe, that we, we manage to demonstrate that it's working. Now, in organizations, to go back to your question, in organizations, absolutely stigma is, is, is being eroded fast because the conversations, the narrative is changing. One of the, one of the, you know, for me, the Cadillac program, and not every organization we work with actually launches what I would call a Cadillac program. Um, but those who do actually will post on their corporate website the names of all their peer supporters and the peer supporters themselves are brave enough to write a few sentences, a little paragraph about their lived experience. They write that. I don't. So if you look at that as a stigma buster, these are employees on the payroll with a full-time job coming literally, you know, this is out of the closet and putting themselves out there to say, 
this is what I've been through in my life. I'm ready to help somebody. I'm proud to be part of this program. If you need help and you think I can help me, give me a call. Send me an email. We'll go for coffee. We'll have a chit chat. That is the that is the ultimate stigma buster. You don't need guys like me to come in and give people a speech after you've done that. I mean, you're literally you're literally eroding stigma at a very very fast pace. And what we're noticing, like I'm not measuring these results. But some of my clients are reporting back to me um, that they've seen a, a pretty significant reduction in long-term and short-term disability in the order of 15% since they implemented the program three years ago. That is not insignificant. That translates. So if the boss wants to launch a peer support initiative because he wants to look good and save money, so be it. But most of my clients launch these initiatives because it it just is the right thing to do. And they reap the benefits, the financial benefits as a as an unintended sort of uh, outcome for them, right? Which is great. It's great all around. Is there a is it is it lean more towards um, private companies or government organizations? Is that is there a typical slant on who engages you more? Well, uh, I mean, I it's very eclectic. Um, you know, uh, right now, uh, you know, uh, there's. Uh, Police force is, is one example. Another example is a federal uh, government department, uh, federal uh, public service. Another example is a private enterprise, a private organization. Um, uh, and uh, and I'm you know we're working with a, a large ins- insurance company right now, uh, which will remain nameless because you know clients don't want to hear about themselves uh, in the news, but. Um, Very eclectic. But, you know, what what is sad, Tim, is that I need a lot of potential clients. And it's not because I want to make millions here. This is a social enterprise. Yes, I have a mortgage to pay, but we're in this business to make change, make social change. Uh, But, yeah, we build people. Uh, But at at the end of the day, I find it sad because so many of our potential clients say, no, Stefan, you know, there's way too much stigma here. You don't understand. It's pretty bad here. And I look at these people, I'm thinking, really? Are you fucking kidding me? Are you kidding me? Come on. You're talking about stigma? Look where I come from. There's no more stigmatizing organization in the military. If we manage to launch a a peer support program there, I think we can do it here. Police forces, that's pretty stigmatizing. So, but you know... uh, Everybody feels that their organization is, 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 is worse off than the next one. And I, I sort of chuckle, to be honest, Tim, and I'm happy to work with those organizations who are willing to move forward. And we're thinking, yeah, stigma is pretty bad, but we're going to take a leap of faith here and go through the process. Now, you don't make a decision to launch a peer support program, by the way, on a Monday and by Friday, you're training people. It takes many, many months. You need to set the conditions for success. You do not create the comfort zone in the corporate setting where people will even apply to become a peer supporter in in a couple of weeks. It takes time. You need to shape that sort of critical piece uh, where applications are being sent in. You just can't throw yourself into that. Um, So there's a process. um, And more and more leaders, I think, in, in corporate Canada are left wanting because they keep doing the same thing over and over again. They keep publishing their 19, you know, 2015 and 2016 brochure on mental health and promoting the EAP, which I'm very for EAP, but uh, the results aren't changing. Results change when you start engaging the one in five. And that's the game changer. Yeah. I feel like still when I talk to, um, when I come across businesses versus just individuals, there still is, um, they love to use the word stress. As you said, stress injury. Um, my, my kind of niche is, is particularly around the anxiety side. But if I, if I ever speak to businesses about doing work with them or talking to them, they, they much, they say, well, can we use the word stress instead of anxiety? Yeah. Um, and obviously I say fine. And then I talk about anxiety anyway, but, um, but it is for sure. I'm, there's still stigma there to be worked through in terms of, you know, the, whoever your initial sponsor is in the organization wants to shape it some particular way. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, it's their comfort zone and, you know, they, and I respect that, you know, I mean, one of our approaches, Tim, at, uh, at, at mental health innovations, the, the social enterprise I, I created and working with partners from, you know, not all corners of Canada, but 
certainly several areas in Canada, great, great associates. One of the one of our our, our sort of flagship approaches is and I learned this with a professor at Ottawa University called Rachel Thibault. She's a she's a she's got a PhD in occupational health and she's a psychologist and she has a very very pragmatic you know such a, a such a common sense approach to things and uh, what 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 she she taught me is what I used to instinctively do you know as a young leader I would always ask for advice and sort of engage my people to say what do you guys think and I would make a decision based on the input I would get from people but what I learned from Rachel is that that is actually called community based rehabilitation and it is a the means by which the world health organization feels that if you're trying to address complex situation complex health related situations in complex scenarios systems environments use community based rehabilitation because it will educate the process so we use that approach we have very and Rachel has always helped us shape our ways to actually engage and tease out the information we need in order to create a solution for our client that has meaning to the people that it matters to. So we have a bottom up approach and that is another thing that organizations are uncomfortable with. People in positions of authority believe that they have to solve it all, figure it all out and plan everything in the ivory tower of corporate headquarters. Meanwhile, we forget that for complex issues such as mental health, engage the one in five go and ask them what they think the solutions can be and you'll be surprised with what you hear so we we have that approach where we i always joke with the with the bosses when i sign a, a new contract i say okay your job is done and you know we joke and he's the vice president of hr will say well don't i need to do a speech or something and i said well if you do a speech keep it down to two minutes and end your speech by saying i'm leaving you in the capable hands of our consultants I don't want to be in the room because I want you guys, my workers, my employees, to be completely honest with the consultants on what we need to do to change things around here. And then I say to the vice, and now leave, leave, leave us with them. And the data we get from employees and managers, and of course, these are different sessions, is outstanding. It just, it just shapes the solutions. And as we implement peer support programs, you know, we need to tap into that knowledge in order to calibrate the program policies to that reality. Because every organization has a different culture, of course. So this community-based rehabilitation is so counterintuitive to so many business leaders that, which is why, which is why there's a lot of people who call us and not a whole lot of people who actually give us contracts, which is fine. Um, because they don't understand the value of of building these types of initiatives from the bottom up, uh, and that's our approach. And the results are are we never fail because we engage the one in five. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are probably coming into it from the point of view of they've seen some statistics in the newspaper about how many sick days people have as a result of depression or anxiety or whatever it happens to be, and therefore they probably think there's financial upside and. I'm sure if that's what it takes for people to get involved in the work, then so be it. At least they're involved. Um, but what what you're saying also resonates because, um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the reasons that I think the peer support model works uh, across the board is that people who have experienced uh, mental health related things just have a better understanding i would say they're more empathetic and more compassionate as well because they they know how it feels to have gone through something challenging to which there isn't an obvious solution you can't get you know your your uh your, you break your leg you get put in a cast and a month later you're walking again there isn't there isn't a an instant cure like that um and so i think people do gravitate a lot, and and this kind of feeding on from what you said about leaders trying to solve everything well if you've never experienced it you can't have the same level of empathy and connection than somebody who says, I know how you feel and therefore I can support you through this. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I'm going back to, to, uh, to really trying to change the narrative, Tim. And, um, uh, I, I say this publicly and I, I'll, I'll say it again publicly through your podcast. I would love to have five minutes with the president of Bell Canada, George Cope. 
and say to George, George, we've talked enough about mental health. Let's start acting now. Let's put our money where our mouth is and let's start acting because this is 2016. And as much as we needed to go through a phase where we talk about mental health, the Bell Let's Talk campaign, I think that's beautiful. It brought us here. But let's not let's not satisfy ourselves by talking about mental health. Let's do let's walk that talk now. And and I think that that those organizations who actually invest time, capital, energy and people in actually translating the narrative into action now uh, are going to be the organizations who are going to be leaps ahead of other organizations. Because as we know, the vast majority, the vast majority of the percentage of disability in workplaces today are in fact mental health struggles. And so those organizations who continue to, to satisfy themselves with, you know, uh, a tweet every once in a while and a new pamphlet and, and a lunch and learn, you know, twice a month and a barbecue with hot dogs on mental health awareness week. Mm. Th- those days are gone. I'm sorry. It's almost be like a lip service, right? It's like, it's like, you know, as you said, it's not, it shouldn't be let's talk. It should be let's do something. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I don't think that those leaders mean to give lip service. They just don't know what to do. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's fine. I mean, they're not in the business of transforming their workplace around mental health, but that's why there's organizations that do that for a living. And they were one of them. And of course, of course, I'm proud of what we do. And, and, uh, uh, but, but yeah, this is, come on guys, change the narrative. And, and the big thing for me too is, you know, when I coined the term stress injury, it was a first attempt 16 years ago to start shaping a new narrative because as long as we use clinical terminology, outside of the clinic, outside of the hospital, outside of that caregiver sort of relationship, we continue to convince ourselves that mental health issues are so complex because this is depression. This is, this is bipolar. This is PTSD. And, and, and we continue to endorse the clinical narrative. I, I often say, Tim, I, I go to a lot of conferences like you. I'm sure you, 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 you listen to a lot of speakers and and doctors giving lectures about the brain. And I always chuckle in the back of the room when I hear, you know, a mental health professional who shares their clinical knowledge to a bunch of non-clinicians around the brain. And some of it is interesting, you know, so this is interesting. But then we get into the things such as, you know, the amygdala, the amygdala in the brain and what it does. And, and the point I'm making is Stefan doesn't really care about the amygdala. You know, what happens in the brain, in the amygdala at this moment in time is sort of interesting, but it is certainly not instrumental in providing me the tools and the wisdom to be able to support somebody. That's like telling me, you know, in order to know not to kick somebody who's got a broken leg on the cast, you know, not to kick the cast, that you need to understand the chemical reactions when the bones start fusing together together. No, you don't need to understand that. And so what we do is we constantly expose, you know, people like you and I, lay people in workplaces, and I'm not belittling us, but we're not doctors. So our solutions have been clinical solutions because that was the only game in town. So what we do is we invite a psychiatrist, a social worker or somebody, and they come in and they give us images of the brain and cross cuts of the brain and show us imagery. And they talk about the amygdala and the all these chemicals running in there. And I'm thinking, how is that useful? That's interesting, not very useful. And so this is why I'm sort of obsessed at changing the narrative, change the narrative around this and, and give it that non-clinical slant so that we re-empower human beings to do what human beings used to do a hundred years ago is ask people how they're doing and not rushing over to their email, asking people how they're doing and sticking around for the answer. Now, there's a sweet spot again. We can't create workplaces that become pity parties either. And so as we transform this, it's important to, keep, to maintain productivity and all this. But we really need to change the narrative and, and re-empower people to be able to care for one another. And it starts with peer support. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right. And um, now I'm going to have to change the name of the podcast to not be the Anxiety Podcast. Um <laughs> but but I, I did I you know interestingly connected in that when I set the podcast up I chose the name because I I didn't want it to um I didn't want to belittle the condition I didn't want to make it like a 
I didn't want to sort of say, well, let's make this, let's just call it Tim's stress podcast and, and not actually get to the heart of the matter. I'm not, I don't have a problem about sharing the actual story about what goes on, but, um, with regard to just talking about it, I also hear what you're saying, which is like, if we don't change, if we don't fundamentally shift the approach, then all we're all, all we're ever going to do is have people like me or you being willing, willing to share our stories and be a hundred percent vulnerable. But the majority of people still feeling like people are going to think badly of them or it's going to affect their employment status if they actually put it all out there and, and share. So yeah, I, I totally agree. And on the brain thing, I mean, I have learned about the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex and all those good things. Um, but I try to break it down for people into simpler terms. And the only benefit of that type of discussion is, is to understand, and this actually helped me with my own specific anxiety, but, um, but I try and break it down into, into a statement like we feel before we think. Yeah. As humans. Yeah. So we're responding to feelings before we've actually engaged you know, engaged our brains to say, is this relevant today? And so I think there's, you know, there's some, there's some benefit in simplification, but the fact of, you know, norepinephrine and amygdalas and all those <laughs> things get a bit too detailed for most people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think it's an important part of, you know, it, I'm not saying erase all that, but we certainly need to create new narratives so that people can feel their comfort Oh, I'm comfortable with that narrative. And I think that's what happened in the military with the stress injury term. Uh, I have a, a friend of mine, a social worker, Suzanne Bailey, who still works in, in one of the programs I launched. And she, she took it further than I ever imagined. She's a great, great social worker. And she really understands the, you know, the, how to balance that clinical and non-clinical narrative. And we were emailing uh, a few months ago, I think, and she says, Stefan, you know, you, you, sh you if this is music to your ears. What I'm hearing as I travel the country still working in the military is that soldiers now are talking about stress injury. The narrative has changed and they're empowered to actually say, hey, Bob's got a stress injury, man. We, we, we need, we need, we need to, you know, go and talk to him as opposed to he's got PTSD. Don't freaking talk to him. Make sure he goes to see a doctor, right? I mean, the culture is shifting and your listeners are probably going to say, Oh, Stefan, come on. It's not shifting. I read another article in the Globe and Mail the other day where a soldier or a veteran was abandoned or had to go through hell. And I'm not saying it's perfect, but you know, you need to start somewhere. And I think the military. Uh, is is going down that journey of transformational change, and I'm I'm proud to have been one of those dominoes to to knock other dominoes, right? And uh, and we'll see what happens in another twenty years, and hopefully, when I'm an old man, I look back on all this and think, yeah, it worked. Uh, and if it didn't work, well, I'll erase myself from society and and retire <laughs> retire like an old curmudgeon military man and and not talk to anybody. I'm joking, but uh, <laughs> it was, it's really good talking to you, Tim. It's, it's, uh, it's, I've, I've never done a podcast before. This is really neat. I'm sure my, I'm sure my dad would love to talk to you as well. Um, only because my dad was in the Royal Air Force, uh, in England and, uh, he, um, I was actually born in Canada. Here's a little bit of history for you. I was born in Canada, but grew up in England because my dad was on a tour of, he was on an exchange with, uh, CFB Trenton. Um, and he, oh, was, yeah. he was a navigator on, uh, Hercules planes. So, uh, okay. And you were born here and then you went back to the UK. Yeah. So I was very fortunate in that I got dual citizenship out of it and, uh, it allowed me to, to be out here now and kind of choose, choose where I want to live for different parts of my life. So yeah. Interesting. That's so cool. Yeah. But I, um, I love the discussion and I think you're doing really important work and I think it is a, a, a bigger shift. Um, you know, what drives me in terms of supporting people and producing the podcast is, is the beacon of light is showing people that, you know, there, are, there is, and I always, my, one of my questions I always bring up on the podcast and with people face to face is like, what's possible in your life if, you take off the the anxious lens or the depressed lens or whatever it happens to be what's possible in your life and i think the peer support program and what you're trying to do with it what you are doing with it is is proving to people that there's life after all of these things and you Absolutely. can yeah and and instead of looking for like a hundred percent solutions or cures or guarantees i think a lot of that comes back to saying you know i'm gonna pick it up and tuck it under my arm and get on with it anyway and the people yeah. who 
evolve and live bigger lives and, and do what they want to do are people who feel a bit uncomfortable, but they decide to, to take action and move forward. So yeah, very cool. Um, when is your book coming out and uh, what's the, what's the story with that? The book is um, so we want to be finished writing in December. Uh, and I'm writing this with uh, a colleague who is a writer and who's very well read in this arena. I'm not I'm not a writer. So basically, he's I think he's starting to realize it's sort of an autobiography. The book is going to start uh, when I land in Kigali in 1994. Mm-hmm. And the book will end uh, with this body of work, essentially. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll probably have a connotation that the American and Canadian Psychiatric Association really need to look at things differently, uh, you know, about the narrative, the narrative and the non-clinical piece and, and really uh, accept that. Um, and really what I found, and I don't want to over-dramatize this, but, you know, Rwanda was a battle and a genocide, and that was a very interesting 10 months uh, it was a bad year for Rwandans and it was a bad year for us who, who were there. Um, and that was a battle, right? Um, coming back home was a battle. Um, working, uh, you know, to try to develop these, these complementary approaches, another battle. Creating a charity to, to, and, and making a charity survive financially and, and developing a credentialing process is a battle. Um, you know, and so the book is, I don't know what the title of the book is going to be, but it's literally sort of, you know, in, in different, in different intensities, of course, sort of a battle to, to not battle the system in an adversarial way, but, you know, change is tough. Uh, and, and so battle from that perspective is to how do you mold a new reality, change a culture, change society, change corporate culture? change the narrative, change the way the American Psychiatric Association views things. Uh, so I think it's a book about the battle throughout, you know, uh, uh, a couple of decades by the time the book is done. Uh, and so, I don't know, the, the manuscript is going to be done in December. We're, we're, we're on schedule. Uh, Adam, my, my shadow co-author, is, is doing an outstanding job. Uh, and, uh, and we'll see what happens. Hopefully we find a publisher and we might rely on you, Tim, to help us, uh, you know, promote this because I think publishers uh, want want to publish books that already come with an audience. So uh, uh, who knows? I might be bugging you at one point. Yeah, and maybe we'll maybe we'll get you back on um, closer to the time for an update, or you can share some more of the stories that happen in the book because you know we've, we're uh, we're up to an hour today, but there's probably much more to talk about. So. Yeah, and on a, on a, on that note, um, I was talking to John O'Connor, who's our, our social media sort of guy um, for the, for the book and, and other work we do at MHI. And uh, just for you to know, the way we're writing this book is I record all of the book, uh, like talk about mini podcasts, but they're not for podcasts. Of course, they go straight to Adam uh, through Dropbox, and. Uh, he writes the book based on all of, so we have an agreed series of, of things that I'm going to talk to about. Uh, and, and so we have the book is essentially all recorded. So there's a, there's, there's going to be a book, but then I will have in archives an audio version of every story in the book because Adam takes these stories and transforms them in, into written word. So that might be interesting to you as well. But, uh, at that time, what I'll do is I'll certainly introduce you to John O'Connor, who you'll just appreciate and love as a human being. He's, he's a great guy, out of the box thinker. But I, there's a lot of raw material there, Tim. So uh, food for thought. Yeah, we'll keep in touch for sure as it evolves. Well, um, thank you, Stefan, for coming on and sharing what you're up to. And yeah, there's I'll be I'll enjoy listening to this again because there's loads of good stuff in it. So thanks for doing it. You're welcome, Tim, and thanks for caring, and keep up the good work, my friend. I appreciate it. Cheers, Stefan. Bye-bye. There you have it. Some great discussion, um, some great points. I certainly enjoyed listening back to that when I was editing it, and you can tell that Stefan is very passionate about the change he has made and the change he wants to make uh, in the space. 
So thanks again to him for coming on. If you, by the way, want to get some more help with your anxiety, you can go back to the old Anxiety Podcast website and you can see on there there's a couple of tabs to check out. There's one which is an online course, a five-week course that you can get involved in. Um, There's also the coaching, um, so you can click on that and find out more about working with me one-on-one. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions or feedback, again, as I said at the start, you can get in touch via social media. You can go to the contact page, send me a message. Um, if you have any show suggestions or people you think I should interview, I am always looking for people who would be a great fit for the podcast to invite on so that we can have a chat with them. Um, and in this last week, I was away at an event and I met probably dozen people who I'm going to interview and they're all amazing with just fantastic unique stories so I can't wait to bring them to the podcast and share them with you and remember until next time less anxiety more life thank you for listening to the anxiety podcast for more information go to the anxietypodcast.com 